And this is kind of fun, right? I mean, this is, you have to do something with your life. You might as well do something that means something. And what's been interesting about this journey with integrative medicine is, you know, it's fun to help people when they're hurting. It's very meaningful to help them when they're sick. It's a lot more fun, and I think probably a lot more productive uh, to help them stay well. If we can train somebody in meditation, we can train somebody in yoga, if we can give an older person Tai Chi lessons so they can go home and do Tai Chi, they're gonna fall less often. That's what the studies tell us. I started Mayo Medical School in 1984, uh, graduated, did a three-year residency, did a year of fellowship, and then actually joined the staff down at Mayo Clinic Arizona. And literally the first patient I saw down there walked in and had a jar of echinacea and wanted to know what's this stuff and can I use it. Next patient told me about a harmonic convergence she had had up at the Red Rocks of Sedona. And so I realized, oh, this is something I wasn't trained for. And recognized that we knew a lot of things our patients were doing were helpful and we didn't know enough about them. But we also knew some of the things they were doing were dangerous or weren't helpful and they were wasting money or putting themselves at risk. So that led to the idea that we should have a program. Back then we called it Complementary Alternative Medicine. And that was actually housed in the Department of Medicine but with participation across the institution. And really we were charged to say, if our patients are asking these questions, how do we give them good information? And uh, we did studies, we found out, guess what? A lot of our patients were stressed. They needed something to help with stress. We brought in some massage, we brought in some mind-body training. We did studies, we found good outcomes, we expanded. Uh, we had a lot of patients with chronic pain. Acupuncture seemed to work, did studies, it worked, we expanded. And so now we have, uh, I think last year, we 30, 35,000 unique patients at Mayo Clinic received acupuncture, massage, uh, meditation training, uh, things that weren't in existence here 15 years ago. The way to find a good supplement manufacturer is do your homework. And by that I mean you actually have to look and find some information about how does a company produce its supplements. So when I go to the website, when I look at the company literature, I really want to see how do they harvest, if, they're har if it's a botanical or an herb, how do they harvest it? How do they know uh, that they've got a good product? And then I want to know how do they do product control? So as they're manufacturing and processing, there should be a number of steps, and I'd like to see all that in plain language. And then at the final step, there's gonna be a capsule or some other product, and it's gonna go into a bottle, and it's gonna be sold. And I wanna see again, how does that manufacturer show us that what's in the bottle is the same as on the label? So that should be pretty clear if we go in and do our homework and look at all those steps. If the company's got all those things lined up, that's a really good start. Now, the nice thing is there's some third parties out there who are taking the next step and saying, I'll look at that supplement and I'll evaluate it, and if it's good, I'll certify that. So there's a company called NSF, you may see that label. USP is another company, United States Pharmacopeia. So those are some extra helps beyond your own homework that can help you find the right manufacturers. Right? Many physicians who especially trained many years ago uh, can still remember or at least remember stories of patients being harmed and so forth. So, so there's a history and I think there's a legitimate reason why many physicians are a little cautious. And remember, it wasn't that long ago that a lot of things on our shelves really weren't good quality. So let's give them credit for that kind of trepidation or maybe a little pushback. Now having said that, with the market changing, with the quality moving up, with good manufacturers coming on board who are presenting good products to the public, I think we have to shift our attitudes. So I think the way I would address those concerns, I, I do this with my colleagues, if they have a patient who's using supplements and they're very dismissive, I always want to go back and remind them that's an indication at least that the patient's trying to be healthy. So that's a good thing and we can work from that. And I think if you can approach your physician with, I want to be healthier, I think part of that might be this supplement. Can you help me figure out the pros and cons? As opposed to, I found this on the internet, I must take it, you must help me with that. I think most of my colleagues will, will come around. They may not have all the knowledge to give you all the answers, but increasingly most medical centers have a physician, a pharmacist, somebody trained to answer those questions. So there's a broader question there, and I think the broader question is, are there risks for herbs and drugs to interact? And the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, and we've seen some very serious reactions. St. John's wort, very popular herb, helps for depression, but it actually interferes with a lot of different drugs. So we've actually had a couple case reports of patients developing heart transplant rejection because the St. John's wort herb affected the drugs that affect transplant rejection. So there's clearly risks, and that means we have to be very smart about mixing herbs and drugs.
There's a perception that dietary supplements aren't well regulated, that the FDA doesn't have much oversight. And I think especially in the realm of adverse effects, things that might be associated with dietary supplements that could cause harm, uh, there's actually a lot of rules and regulations. In fact, they're very much similar to what we expect with drugs. So if a drug causes an adverse effect, it can be labeled either serious or minor. The serious ones have to be reported right away. The minor ones are collected, and we learn a lot that way about what's the safety of our drugs. Well, exactly the same rules apply to a dietary supplement. So if a dietary supplement causes a significant reaction, a severe reaction, that has to be reported, I think, within 15 days to the FDA. So there's a very quick response time to find out, hey, something on the market has caused a problem. If it's a more minor problem, well, the, the companies have much more leeway in reporting those, but they have to collect the data, track it over time, and keep a record. And so that's a good way, to actually, for the supplements to stay safe, because we can find out if something's changing, something new's entered the market, something's not being manufactured appropriately, or maybe something snuck in there as an adulterant by mistake. So a lot of ways that the FDA treats dietary supplements are very similar to how the FDA treats drugs. So the companies are actually required to collect that information. If there's an adverse uh, event, it's supposed to come to the company. So I would say most companies have an in-house service. They collect the data themselves, they record it, and that's good. But I think you can distinguish really good companies, best in class, by those who also have an independent group, an independent company, also collect that data. Now these independent uh, companies will sometimes have toxicologists, physicians, other experts so they can really look at that data and find out if anything's changing or um, if unexpected adverse events are occurring. The, the label is going to tell us a lot about what's in there. That's probably the most important. We also want to make sure uh, that there aren't things in there we don't want. So some of the fillers or magnesium stearate is in a lot of these supplements. We like to keep people away from those because there's probably no health benefit and maybe some health risks. So looking for what's in there, does it have what you're looking for? For example, if you heard about a good study on, uh, Mayo Clinic did a study on ginseng for cancer-related fatigue. Well, you'd want to find the same ginseng produced the same way, manufactured the same way. So look for what's in there, and also maybe look for what's been added that you don't need. For quite a long time, the market has been fairly loose in the United States, and there was a lot of manufacturers putting things on the shelves that weren't good quality. That's very clear, and that made a lot of physicians skeptical about dietary supplements, because there's lots of cases where a uh, government agency would pull 10 or 20 different brands off the shelf and show that, for example, the ginseng product had no ginseng in it. So we have that history. What's changed quite a bit since 2010 is something called current good manufacturing practices. That's a, a mandate that anybody that sells or manufactures supplements in the United States now is supposed to follow something called good manufacturing practices. And that's meant to bring that quality back up to where it should be. And this was rolled out over a span of several years, but fully implemented in 2010. And what that requires for dietary supplement manufacturers is basically to have pretty much good control of the quality process from harvest to processing to on the shelf and even into the quality and how long it might last in the shelves and so forth. So that's all fairly recent uh, and really the full implementation was in 2010. Now that's pretty close to what we expect of our drug manufacturers. Our drug manufacturing uh, requires even further testing for shelf life and expiration dates and so forth. But if you look at how we are now supposed to handle our herbs and dietary supplements in the United States, it's very similar in terms of those quality control measures that are now mandated.